Uh, so thanks everyone for coming. Um, I'm Jason McGee. Uh, this is a Ask Me Anything uh, panel on uh, service meshes and microservices. Um, the way Ask Me Anything is supposed to work is we're not prepared at all. <laughs> we have no materials. You're supposed to ask us whatever random questions come to your mind. Um, so hopefully that'll work out. Uh, if not, I will, I will break the ice. Uh, why don't we start with uh, introductions? Um, so I'll, I'll ask the panel to describe what they do, and then we'll launch into it. So Lynn, do you want to start? We'll go that way. Sorry. Can you guys hear me OK? Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Lynn Sang. I work uh, for IBM. I'm a senior technical staff member and master inventor there. I just recently joined the Istio project. Since August this year, I've been sp speaking about monitoring and metrics with your microservices. I also have a session on reliable uh, deploy your application with Istio on Friday. Gotta go to William. William. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> hey, everyone. Uh, I'm William Morgan. I'm the CEO of a company called Buoyant, which makes a service mesh called Linkerd, and another one we just announced yesterday called Conduit. I am not good at keeping track of what time it is, but I am very fast when I run. <laughs> hey, everyone. Uh, I'm Sven. I'm uh, from Google. I'm one of the founders of the Istio project, um, and I've been working on actually mostly API management related stuff for the last decade. My name is Christian Posta. I'm a chief architect of cloud application development at Red Hat. I wrote a book called Microservices for Java Developers, and I work with our customers to help them build out uh, competencies in microservices and DevOps. Hey, I'm Matt from Lyft. Uh, I work on our uh, networking team, where we do all types of load balancing, service discovery, uh, proxies. Uh, I'm mostly known for Envoy, the, the proxy. Right. Very happy to be here. Thank you. <laughs> and then uh, Jason, obviously, and my role at IBM is I run our containers uh, and microservices work, and so uh, our Kubernetes service and the work we're doing uh, around Istio kind of fall into that. Um, so with that, um, maybe I'll open it up with a single, simple, basic question, which is what is a service mesh? Since this is kind of a new idea, why don't we start with uh, what you guys think what a service mesh is, and then you guys can launch into it. Anyone want to take a pass? This is the fun part of panels. You have to like, you know, volunteer to talk. <laughs> it's interesting they picked me yeah. on the new. Per Can you guys hear me? Okay, yeah. it's interesting they picked me as a new person on coming into Service Mesh. So I thought Service Mesh is really interesting. Uh, I always think Service Mesh as a free tag. Um, I'm a savvy shopper. I always like to shop for things for a cheaper price. So with Service Mesh, it really gives developer um, the visibility into their microservices. It really uh, gives developer to be able to securely connect their microservices. It also gives developers uh, traffic management policy enforcement of their microservices. And what's amazing about that is you actually get it for free without changing your application. Um, so that's what I really love about service mesh yeah I think the uh, the answer we usually give is the service mesh is a network for services instead of bytes that's I think our tagline um, for some of our talks so it's it's a way to think about services instead of thinking about bytes and connections and right like IP addresses talking to IP addresses you shouldn't have to think about that you should think about services talking to the services and how do you make that all work yeah and I have a background in integration and messaging, um, message, building message brokers and that kind of stuff. And to me, this is sort of a, a nice evolution of some of the problems we've solved in the past with those types of technologies, like ESBs and message brokers and that kind of stuff. Um, and, it's, and it works awesome in a container environment. It's, it's sort of reimagined in, in, in this new container environment. Um, and allows us to do really interesting things that we couldn't do before. Uh, observability and resiliency baked into the system, not just individual applications and so on. Yeah, I, I mean, um, 
I would say that you know the the biggest thing that we're seeing right now is that most companies they're essentially moving from architectures where they might use one language, right? So if you look ten years ago, people might have been using Java or C plus plus or something like that, and it's a lot more common now that people are using multiple languages. Like you'll see companies that have five, seven, ten different languages, and what you find in that type of architecture is that there's a lot of common functionality that people have to use, right? And it's mostly around networking. It's mostly around load balancing, service discovery, observability. And what we found over the past 10 or 15 years is that you have to be either a, a giant company that can possibly you know, pick three to four languages and invest a team of 30 to 40 people to maintain libraries in all of those languages, or you can implement something essentially once, and then you can use that across all of, all of your different languages. Um, so you know, from a proxy perspective, the, the benefit that we get of having one piece of code you know, that is highly performant um, and can have you know, a huge set of functionality and we can use it across all the different languages, it doesn't matter if it's Haskell or, or Go or something else, it, it just works anywhere, is a, is a super, super powerful paradigm. Yeah, I agree. All right. Oh, William, sorry. We actually struggled with this term a fair amount with Linkerd because when we released you know, Linkerd 0.1 or whatever it was in early 2015, we didn't really know what to call it. And, you know, we called it, uh, we, we tried a couple things. We called it an application router, and then we called it, you know, an RPC proxy, because that was kind of what was in our head from, from the Twitter days. And, of course, people were like, well, you know, I already have an HA, you know, I already have HA proxy. And we'd be like, well, no, you know, it's, it's different from that, different set of features. Well, we're not using our RPC, we're using HTTP. And we say, no, well, actually, you know, RPC is like a, HTTP is like a type of RPC for And by the time you like went through this, you know, explanation, they were bored and like wa wandered off. <laughs> uh, and so we, try, we kept trying different terms and you know, eventually we, were, we, we called it a service mesh, which didn't really have a lot of meaning at the time, but it was at least like a blank space that people, you know, that, that, that people didn't immediately associate with something else other right. than like, I don't know, there's a service mesh company, I guess, where the CEO is in legal trouble in Australia. And that was like <laughs> the number one like SEO you know, competition. Um, but yeah, once I think once that term started to gain popularity, it became a lot easier, I think, to, to describe what exactly this is, because it is kind of a, a shift, you yeah. know. I don't yeah. think it's something that's totally, it's not like new functionality per se, but it's a shift in really where that functionality is located. Yeah, great. Yeah. Uh, talk loudly. No, there's more. So, um, do you guys want to comment on how you see in CNCF things being uh, basically sorted out between the controller where Istio plays and the agents in the data plane? Because I think right now there are two projects listed, some agent in the, in the agent space, some I think cover agent and controller. So between Istio, Linkerd, and, and um, uh, basically Envoy and the others possible agents, how do you see things sorted out in a monolith fashion or well, you, what do you mean sorted out? Like, I mean, um, in the end, I think I see value in having a, in a controller space, things like pilot, mixer, and, and uh, the authentication part, maybe other things will be added. And then agents could be, you know, differentiated, could do things better than one than each other. So how do you see things coming together, right? To have a service mesh and options in the controller, in the agent. Make sense? Yeah. All right, well, I guess I'm talking, I'll answer it. Um, I guess the first thing I want to stress is that um, the CNCF is not around to pick winners of which one should be the, the, the thing. Um, and I think Istio itself is, is nicely, intending to be nicely built to be pluggable for a lot of these different uh, components. Um, and I think the, you know, the communities as, as they go and as CNCF helps foster those communities, they'll, uh, they'll Ideally, work together nicely. We'll see, and then um, you know, their their uh, trajectory after that is up to the communities. So I, I want to add one thing. Um, so I think for as part of the Istio project, one of the things we're trying to do is uh, come up with well-defined APIs for these different um, interactions between the components, and then you get a lot of this kind of uh, innovation in components, and different people can plug in different components. Um, one of the things, for example sort of self-serving from our side is we've worked on gRPC and Istio, 
And we want to make sure that over time, you know, gRPC can plug in directly without having to use a proxy. Um, so you have to have those well-defined abstractions or you just can't do that. Um, so we want to make sure that that all makes sense. And we're also, you know, obviously all of this is evolving independently and like <laughs> everything's changing at the same time and it's really interesting to, to sort of watch the control plane APIs come together. Um, the data plane APIs, actually Envoy did um, a, a lot of the work sort of standardizing those APIs and trying to have a standard API actually Matt should probably talk about this because yeah. he has also thoughts on it. Hey, um, yeah, so it, it's, a, it's a super interesting topic, right? Because you have the actual proxy, you know, you have this thing that's basically pumping packets and doing L7 proxying and, and you know, essentially doing all of these things. And then you have some controlling entity. So you have the data plane and then you have the control plane. And, um, you know, I, I think there's a lot of confusion right now around these two concepts. I think people look at Istio, and I've seen a lot of people talk about, you know, is, is Istio uh, a direct competitor to something like Linkerd, or is, is Istio the same thing as Envoy, right? And, and they're, they're not. I mean, essentially, Istio is a control plane. It's a thing that can take a bunch of proxies and it can build them together into a, into a larger system. And, at, you know, as it's designed, you can take Istio and you can use it with Linkerd, you can use it with Nginx, you could use it with HAProxy, you can use it with Envoy. Um, I, I do think that there's going to be a lot of competition in this space in both the data plane side as well as control plane. And ultimately, I, I do think there are going to be winners and losers. I, I, I don't think we are there yet, right? So I think this is a super, super active space. Um, but I think the most important thing to kind of take away is that we are attempting to build these APIs so that both sides are essentially pluggable and that, you know, if, if you want to take Envoy, we're trying very hard where, like, for example, today at Lyft, we don't actually use Istio. I mean, because we, we had Envoy well before there was Istio, right? So, like, we have a huge Envoy deployment at Lyft that uses our own home homegrown control plane, which is honestly pretty janky, but that's just the way things work, right? Um, and, you know, ultimately, we will move to a more complex system. But because we have these APIs, we can literally swap in Istio or some product that we buy from some vendor, and that will be our control plane, and we will use Envoy. Or vice versa, someone that's unhappy with Envoy in Istio, if there's a better proxy out there, they can swap that proxy in. I think Matt had a really good blog post about data plane versus control plane, which if you haven't read, I recommend taking a look at. That was actually really helpful for us, because for Linkerd, we've kind of always talked about it as in kind of a data plane, you know, terminology, but there actually is a, a control plane called Namerd, which we never really talked about as such, but if, you know, that's what you use. Uh, with Conduit, which we released yesterday, uh, we, we, we kind of were very explicit about, okay, these parts are the control plane, these parts are the data plane, and, we, and similar to Istio, I think separating those two out gives you, you know, there, there's different requirements for, for those two parts of the system, and so we were able to make different, different kind of technical choices in the data plane from what we made in the, in the control plane. Yeah, I just want to add, I agree with many of you guys said. Uh, one thing I find super interesting recently is I actually did an experimental on uh, how the Envoy sidecar um, as the data plane participated in Istio, talked to the Istio control plane, and it's super interesting to learn in the Istio environment, the Envoy sidecar is actually a dummy router without the pilot. Um, so it's funny that we have a pilot agent talking to pilot that actually communicate from the data plane to the control plane, which um, programmably be able to enable Envoy to be smart in the mesh. So that was interesting learning for me. I have a question. Istio docs say that uh, Istio uses an extended or enhanced version of, of Envoy. Can you help me understand what that means, what enhancements and why were the enhancements done? To me, it seems like Envoy's been forked. Uh, the enhancements have been added. Why not just add these enhancements to Envoy directly? So uh, I'll take a quick quick pass at that. So uh, we, we, this is not a fork, right? So Envoy has a, a pluggable API for adding filters. We add some filters. So we have a filter for calling into our control plane. Um, and we're actually actively working on trying to unify that and actually standardize that and upstream it. Um, we also have things like a filter for doing uh, JWT token decoding. We're going to try and upstream that. So I think it's we're sort of experimenting with different filters and then bringing them upstream as as they make sense to do so. 
Yeah. Um, I would add that, right, so there's this uh, filter mechanism. Um, and, you know, so, so folks can basically build their own filters and they can compile Envoy to actually, you know, use those filters. Um, we, we are um, essentially attempting to make it so that people that use Envoy never have to change the core Envoy code, right? Like that's a, that's a design goal of Envoy itself. So when people come to us and say, you know, we would like to do this thing in a filter and it can't be done, we are going to change the core Envoy to make it so they can do that thing. So at, at Lyft, for example, we have, we have private filters that we can't open source because they do auth and they talk about drivers and cars and it's like, it's just not something that we can open source. Um, but the way that we compile Envoy at Lyft is we literally include the, the public Envoy as a sub-module, we compile and link in our filters, and that's it. Um, so it's, it will always be a goal that, that we kind of have that very, very clean separation. And in fact, what we're gonna be doing, hopefully in the 1.6 release cycle, is we're gonna reorganize the repo to look a little more like Linux kernel, where basically all of the filters, they're, they're kind of like drivers, so they'll be in their own directory, and it'll be easier to kind of mark them as being experimental mental or production ready and have and have owners. So like for example, if someone wants to come in and do Kafka but it's not production ready, we can put it in the experimental section and people can go and actually try it out. Great. Yeah, I just want to quickly add, it actually took me by surprise as a new contributor into Istio. Um, the Istio um, proxy image is actually built uh, in the pilot directory, not in the uh, proxy directory, and that took me a while to figure that out. Essentially, out of Istio, we built uh, two proxy image. One is for the regular proxy, which has Envoy. Uh, we consume Envoy uh, along with the additional feature we added to the Envoy. We also have a proxy debug image that have um, different uh, utilities we need, so it really helps us to debug proxy issues uh, when we have it, and we ship it by default in Istio. Okay, other questions? Can you speak about the largest deployments of service mesh you've seen? So if I'm running on hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands of nodes, what challenges do I expect and how do I resolve them? Lots of challenges. So, uh, um, so we're not using Istio or, um, or uh, Linkerd or any of these other service meshes, but Google has been doing this internally for a decade, um, and so hundreds of millions of tasks, basically. Yeah, I mean, we, we run Envoy at this point on somewhere between probably about 20,000 machines, uh, and we do about, you know, five, five million requests per second through, through the whole mesh. Um, so we're, we're probably the largest, like, pu public service mesh at this point. Um, there's, there's a lot of customers coming up, and I'm, and I'm sure Boyan has some too, uh, you know, and I, I, I think that um, what, what I find is that people are initially very skeptical of this, and they're skeptical really because they say, how can you have this thing, right, that you're putting in the data path? Like, it must be slow, or it must add all this latency. That is so stupid, I would never actually do that. And what, what we find is that, you know, it's true that a proxy like Envoy does add latency. It's going to add, you know, probably around one millisecond per hop, depending on what it's configured to do. And it's true that there are some people that really care about microseconds and they're going to whine about 200 microseconds. What, what I would quite honestly say is that for most people, they don't give a shit about one millisecond. They won't even notice. Like, it, it's just, it's gone. And if you, if you look at the benefits that come, just the unification of observability, of the features, like, it, it is just so incredible that once developers experience this, they honestly will never go back and they don't care about the latency. Yeah. So, Slightly yeah. slower, but always up. Well, they, they, don't, they, they don't even know that it's slower. Right. Yeah, yeah. We run into this a fair amount with Linkerd, and actually our, our, our answer is that we can actually speed things up. Even, mm -hmm. even though we're adding you know, extra hops at each point by being intelligent about how you're routing the traffic by load balancing based on observed latencies and all sorts of fancy stuff like that, you can actually improve end-to-end -end times, you know, even if you're introducing this kind of constant um, you know, on a per hop basis. Yeah. Uh, and that's with Linkerd, which has like a, you know, I think our advertised performance is like 
P99 of five milliseconds or something with with conduit, which you know, in, in which the data plane is written in in Rust, where you know P99 is less less than a millisecond. So it's even harder to make that to make that argument. Right. Here, I, I'd like to ask a quick question. To, I realize this is a panel; you ask us questions, but let me ask you a question. If you could, I'm just curious. If you could raise your hand, if you're using any kind of service mesh technology today, just curious what the Awesome. Wow. That's more than I. How many people it. are are exploring it or plan to explore it? Um, awesome. <laughs> All right. What are the rest of you doing here? <laughs> Get out. All right. Question. Let's go to the back. I don't want to preference the uh, front. So the thing which is not very clear to me is. If I have an application which is running in my Kubernetes cluster right now and I'm using some network plugin and I want to move it to a service mesh, do I need to change my container image or just I take my existing image and I replace that plugin with a service mesh? It could be Envoy or Linkerd. And if if there are two services which talk on some protocol, let, or they just use REST HTTP, do they keep using REST HTTP or some mechanism change underneath in the data part? <coughs> Yeah, was the was the question just a, a clar clarifying follow up? Was the was the question about if you have applications that use certain types of mesh technology like Netflix OSS or something in the image? Do you have to change that, or what was the question about the original? Uh, so, so my application is using let's say Flannel or Calico plugin, uh, and I want to use, I, I want to try out service mesh in my application. An application has like multiple multiple services. So do I change my image or? Those images are just, I can, I can replace that plugin with the service mesh. I got you. All right. Yeah. Um, so we've actually tested, uh, with, like, Calico and at least Istio work together just fine, so you don't need to change anything there. Um, the model for Istio is actually that you can deploy this without any changes to your application code whatsoever. Um, you do have to redeploy because we have to add the proxies, and Kubernetes, for example, cannot dynamically add new containers to your pods. Um, and like dynamically getting the IP tables hooked up and stuff is pretty difficult. So you do have to do a rolling restart um, of your jobs to, to get the proxy in place, but you don't have to actually change the code at all. And the, the application still communicates using whatever it used to be communicating. So um, for example, you can do just plain text rest, and that's what it looks like from the application, from the client and the server, it looks like plain text rest. Over the internet, or, or no, over the internet, over the network, um, or internet if you're multi-cluster. Uh, it's, it's all encrypted, it's all mutual TLS. Um, so it's, it's sort of dynamically upgraded into more secure and adding identity and all this stuff, and the applications don't need to know about it or care about it or make any changes. Yeah, if you were at the keynote this morning, you saw Oliver do a, a live you know, reload of a deployment and, <laughs> and add it to the mesh without the, the application really knowing anything about it. Yeah, one thing I want to quickly add, um, it took us by surprise uh, also, is uh, we actually don't intend to support applications that are using host networking. So uh, inside of Istio, if your application actually requires host networking, we are going to not inject the sidecar for you, because we really don't want the impact to the host and uh, destroy your Kubernetes cluster. So definitely watch out for that too. Yeah, so there's one small point, actually, and, and we, we love to sit up here and talk about how the service mesh is the most amazing thing, and it's fantastic, and it's really awesome. Um, but it, th there is one point about deployment, and um, what you'll realize is that when you want to do tracing, you actually have to propagate state, and that's a very important point. And what that means is that though the service mesh right, can do all these things, if you want to look at your traces and you, and you want to look at logs and you want to have them actually be joined, there's no way to avoid the application actually propagating some small piece of state. Now, the code in the application is like 100 lines of code versus 100,000 lines of code, so it's very trivial. But I just wanted to point out that when we talk about this magic and injecting with IP tables and a bunch of stuff, that's not quite true. And because of that, I think when people deploy service mesh, since Ultimately, to get, full, to get full value, you'll have to have some client library. It might be very thin. Um, you don't necessarily have to use IP tables. So for example, at Lyft, we've made a conscious decision that because we make people essentially use this very thin library for networking, which we call Envoy Client, we just have them talk to Envoy on a known port. 
right? And then we don't need any IP tables magic. And from our perspective, from an operations kind of thing, that, that just makes it much, much simpler. Um, but whether you, you know, whether you use IP tables or, you know, or, or not, I just wanted to point out that to get full value, you're going to have to have some code in your application that is actually aware. And I, I think going forward, we're going to see a little bit more of that. I think we're going to see, I, I, I don't know how it's going to play out, but I, I've talked with customers that, that feel that they would have some value out of knowing a little bit more context about what the proxy is doing. Yeah. Why is it failing? Why are we getting circuit break uh, broken and so on? Yeah, I, I, I think that you know we are just scratching the surface now of, right. of the communication between the proxy and the actual application. And one of my biggest frustrations right now when I actually look around the industry is it's not that we're gonna get rid of networking libraries, right? Like that's impossible, we still have to have them. We have to propagate state, and we have to do all, you know, essentially do all these things. But since we have to have this code, we can have proxies actually return actually special status codes around things like we did circuit breaking, so we were overloaded. So instead of returning a 503, which means nothing, tell, tell me why, right? Like was there no upstream host? Was it circuit breaking? Was there some other problem? Um, and, and then we can do much more intelligent things. So I, I think I'm hoping that actually there will be unification not only of proxy technology, but also of the libraries that people use in their, in their applications. Good. Uh, so I did a lot of work with uh, OpenShift for a couple of years, and kind of one of the, the pitches there, I think, is um, that the, the SDN that it lays down is very Linux-y, right? So there's really nothing special. There's HA proxy for ingress, and then everything is open vSwitch and vXLAN all the way down. Uh, that's That has its benefits, right, because it's very well documented, and there's generally a lot of niche community around it, um, and we don't have to rely on you know updates to specialized software for that. Um, one of the biggest downsides is that as a metrics geek, I can't see much of what's happening in that. Um, observability is a nightmare in that environment. Um, so this is kind of an elaboration on what you've already started talking about, but um, what are some of the, can you guys elaborate on what observability features come with the various uh, mesh, techs, mesh, mesh technologies that are there? Uh, and maybe if there is a paradigm shift kind of on how to think about monitoring these things, what might that be? Great question. Um, so yeah, yesterday I actually did a talk um, uh, observability with Istio at the Istio Summit. Um, so there's actually a growing rich ecosystem out there. So out of the box, through the Istio add-on, there's Premises, there's Grafana. Istio actually provide a native Istio dashboard. So it has all the visibility into your service mesh. You have statistics on what's going on globally at the mesh. You have statistic uh, breakdown to each individual of your services and even versions of your services. If you have multiple versions, so you know like uh, what's going on, how much uh, time you spend on each of the service, so what are the error return code, successful rate. So all that information is available through Istio. Uh, the other thing Istio um, provides is distributed tracing through Zipkin. So you can just uh, kubectl install uh, Zipkin YAML file, which you get the Zipkin uh, distributed tracing. And what's that do is every single request as a user, you visit your application, it's all captured in the Zipkin distributed tracing. And I was joking yesterday, I'm a human, I don't want to analyze all these single requests, like every single seconds, there could be um, hundreds and hundreds of requests to come through my Zipkin, and we don't want necessarily analyze that. So what we did at IBM Research is a project called Istio Analytic, where we actually um, bring analytic through Zipkin uh, data pumped through Zipkin, and we analyze uh, aggregate data for you. So I ex expect to see more of these type of data uh, analytic tooling around distributed tracing come through the market that actually really give people visibility into what's going on within a period of time through the aggregated tracing and how do you actually compare your base uh, tracing and your canary deployment. I think the, the power of the service mesh is that the visibility that it gives you is kind of the top line service metrics. Like these are the things that you want to be 
woken up at 3 a.m. for, right? It's like success rate and latency and request volume. And like, you know, Kubernetes will give you, if you have Heapster enabled, will give you like CPU usage or whatever. But, you know, CPU's going up, memory's going up. I don't know, maybe you don't want to wake up. But if success rate is going down, then yeah, you definitely want to wake up. Uh, and the service mesh, like that's a lay layer of visibility that I can give you in most cases without you having to do anything. Like Matt said, with distributed tracing, you then have to do some, some work on the application side. Um, but even that layer of visibility, I think, can be super powerful. Like at the, uh, you know, I'll, I'll refer again to the keynote this morning. Oliver kind of skipped over that, but there was a command line in there where, you know, after injecting the, the application into the conduit service mesh, he just listed per method success rates in the CLI. And like, you know, all of a sudden, you have access to this thing that you've never had access to before. And that's, you know, Forget about reliability, forget about security, forget about any of that stuff. Just that layer of visibility is, is super powerful. Because you haven't had it before, right? Especially in a polyglot environment where, okay, your only option is to like, do, do this the hard way. Yeah, I actually, I just want to echo that. I was going to say basically the same thing, so I'll try to be quick. But um, the, the thing I wanted to point out is that you don't actually want to be monitoring your infrastructure, right? You want to be monitoring your services. And so the service mesh gives you that visibility as... as um, He's saying like that you just didn't have that before, and you did have to try and like use monitoring of infrastructure to think about whether the services are working or not. And it's like you're trying to make these leaps, and that's just not the right way to do this. You should be monitoring the services. Then you know the service is working or it's not. If the service is working, I don't care what's going on underneath, and I shouldn't have to worry about it. I was just going to add one one last thing. Um, so Istio, the Istio layer especially as an OpenShift user or, or you've used it in the past, that would, in, in my mind, that sort of just blends into the platform, right? But the platform should have the ability to do logging, metrics collection, and now all of these other capabilities. You're able to do distributed tracing and that stuff. At Red Hat, we're working on adding Jaeger support for, which is uh, open tracing from Uber, um, support to, to Istio and so on. Um, but I'm, I'm really excited that now that we have these control points, now that these proxies are there and live with our application, um, we're going to continue to be able to build a lot more observability on top of that. Yeah, I, I mean, people people look at these systems and they look at all the cool features. Oh, you know, it does Redis or it does like load balancing and shadowing and and like this and that. And when I talk to people, the the, the honest reality is that it, it is all about observability. Like that is the reason that we built Envoy. And, and the other thing that I would add is I, I think the move towards a more DevOps culture for most companies actually, you know, I, I don't like that word, but in fact, I hate that word. But but. And by DevOps, I just mean that I, I am on call for Envoy, me, right? <laughs> so, like, you know, it, it is extremely important to me that I can operate it well, like, extremely important. And what operating it well means is having, you know, incredible stat output, like, incredible logging output, like, actual tracing that we can actually look into. Um, and and I 100% I agree that the future is actually to take this output and in real time basically do machine learning and have a feedback loop. And I, I, I mean, my, my personal opinion is that, you know, most of the data plane stuff is going to become commodity. Like, there, you know, it, it's going to flush itself out in the next two or three years. There's going to be a commodity data plane that everyone's going to use. The actual competition is going to be on the data analytics. So, like, feeding the data in, telling you what's what's going on, what's bad, like, how, how do you fix it? Um, visualization, right? All of those things. So, I, I mean, this is like a super long-winded answer to your question, but th this is by fo this is by far the most most important thing. Like, it like. Envoy, to me, is all about observability. Everything else is totally secondary. OK. We have one more over here. <laughs> so uh, the way I see Envoy, it can become a distributed message bus. And as such, is it a competitive technology to Kafka? Is it complementary to Kafka? How do you see that path? Oh, that's a, that's, a, that's a good one. Uh, do, you, do you want to take that first, or do you Go want for it? Um, I, you know, I, I think right now, um, I, I think there's two, there's two discrete architectures and most companies do, do both, right? So it's like we have real-time systems that are basically synchronous and then we have asynchronous message passing systems. And most architectures that I see at this point are, are using a combination of both. And you, you pick the one that you need and at, at Lyft we do both. I mean, it's like we have a, a whole bunch of real-time systems and we have a whole bunch of, whole bunch of stream processing systems. 
Um, whether something like Envoy could be extended to do work with Kafka or like replace Kafka or something like that, I would say no. Like there's no reason to replace Kafka. Could Envoy augment Kafka with a built-in L7 filter to do all kinds of cool things? I think the answer is, is yes. So I think we will see more convergence of service mesh and message bus systems. Um, but I, I, I don't think like one is going to take over the other. Yeah, I totally agree with that. And there's there's just there's totally different use cases for for messaging. Yeah. Um, but one thing I do want to point out is that because, for example, control planes like Istio have uh, APIs to be able to plug in different proxies, uh, we we absolutely could see we have we have customers who are who are working with to see um, how to build messaging capabilities into the infrastructure. Similarly, lo the, the way we see. Uh, service mesh being baked into the infrastructure, resiliency, observability, that kind of stuff. We have a project in uh, the Apache Cupid community called Cupid Dispatch Router, which is a small, lightweight AMQP uh, proxy that, that knows how to um, distribute messages across a messaging a mesh, a more, real, more AMQP traditional type messaging. Um, and plugging that into Istio is, is something that we're exploring. But yeah, Kafka and, and Envoy, I think those are two, two kind of different different things right now. Right. I just want to real, real quick add, the other really interesting thing, can, thing coming out that Service Mesh is going to have to deal with is the serverless um, yeah. and functions and how we, so messages and serverless are like, those are the next next frontiers. Right. And, and with that, we'll, uh, we're out of time. Uh, thank you. You guys did a good job. Yeah, thank you, guys. Thank yeah, you guys for coming. Thanks for the panel. And thank you. Thanks a lot.